On the coast of Brazil lies a series of lagoons amongst the coastline. There is little vegetation, and as a consequence, very few herbivores. There are, however, many predators, including the Spinosaur, Irritator. These six-meter-long carnivores are rather small for Spinosaurs, but like their larger relatives, they are adapted to a semi-aquatic lifestyle. Feeding on the fish, turtles, and crocodiles that inhabit these lagoons, rivers, and the seashore that make up their home. Their adaptations include broader tails, raised nostrils, and conical teeth. These have allowed them to remain in this environment, where other dinosaurs could not. At this time of year, they gather in great numbers in and around the shallow lagoons. Though there doesn't appear to be anything here that could sustain such a large congregation of these crocodile-like predators. All across the sand, however, there is movement. Just beneath the surface are thousands of eggs, and now it is time for them to hatch. Crawling from beneath the surface come helpless turtle hatchlings. Just like their modern counterparts, they were laid here months ago by their mothers, and now must make a mad dash to the ocean. However, the distances are far greater for some, and there is little cover. Even worse, they are never too far away from the massive irritators. For the most part, the large dinosaurs ignore the scrambling hatchlings. They are not the reason they are here. Resting on the many rocky outcrops and flying overhead are multiple species of pterosaur. From Tapijara to Maradactylus, all have come here to take advantage of the freshly hatched turtles, and whenever a new group breaks the surface, multiple pterosaurs take wing and descend to pluck up the bite-sized reptiles. However, in order to get a meal, the pterosaurs have to land, and it is then that the irritators make their move. Rising out of the water, or appearing from behind rocks and bits of foliage, the irritators will try and run down the grounded pterosaurs before they can take off. In a dangerous game of cat and mouse, the flying reptiles will try to scoop up as many turtles as they can before taking to the wing, as one or more of the large carnivores race to snap them up in their jaws. Some, like the tapijara, are small, with a wingspan not much more than a meter, and can take off quickly, while only needing to grab one or two of the hatchlings. Others, like the Maradactylus, have wingspans of over 6 meters, so they need to grab more hatchlings, and take longer to get back in the air. But the irritators don't always get their meal. Their adaptations for a more aquatic lifestyle mean they are not as fleet of foot as the other theropods. However, at this time of year, they run, jump, and even slide across the sand in their attempts to catch the graceful flyers. Despite all the pterosaurs looking very different, they are all thin and fragile. Once an irritator has a pterosaur in its grasp, it is all over. One irritator charges into a mass of tapijara, but in the confusion as the flock takes off, he doesn't manage to grab one. The flock does, however, fly over a second irritator, who leaps up and snatches one out of midair. He throws his head back and swallows it whole. Further down the beach, a different irritator bursts out of the edge of the water to charge down an unsuspecting Maradactylus. He pins it under his foot, but immediately has to defend his kill as two or more of his kind try to take his prize. All up the beach is a mad display of predators trying to outdo each other. A test of speed and timing across kilometers of sand. The irritator inadvertently saved many of the turtle hatchlings by killing or frightening off the different pterosaurs. Although they do step on many of them, they are usually only pushed back into the sand, which they hastily crawl out of. But if it wasn't for these hungry dinosaurs, far less of these newborn turtles would ever make it off this beach. Hello everyone and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down the pterosaur's bane, Irritator. But before we get onto the facts about this creature, why does it have such a weird name? Well, the holotype specimen was originally discovered by fossil hunters slash poachers 
who then artificially elongated the skull to increase its value. They then sold it to the State Museum of Natural History in Stewartgard, claiming it was a pterosaur skull. Upon the fossil arriving, the forgeries were discovered, along with some other damage to the skull, so they had to undo the lengthening. This is a very long and painstaking process that along with the discovery that it wasn't a pterosaur, but a theropod, was so annoying that the scientists working on it named the new species Irritator. Which seems a little childish, but I think I might have done something similar in their shoes. The species name, Irritator Challengeri, is after the fictional character Professor Challenger from the original Lost World novel. This is a very abridged part of the tale, so now on to the facts. Although its exact location of discovery isn't known for sure, it is believed to have come from the Arapai Basin in northeast Brazil, thanks to microfossils found on the holotype that are also from this region. Irritator was a spinosaur that lived around 113 to 110 million years ago in the early Cretaceous period. Only the holotype has been discovered, however, it is the most complete spinosaur skull ever found, and other remains belonging to the species Engaturama, which is also a spinosaur, help fill in some gaps. Engaturama lived at the same time as Irritator, and the two may be the same species. If they are found to be the same, Irritator was named first about a month before, so it would keep its name. There are other Spinosaur remains in that area that haven't been assigned to a species, so these may also be Irritator or another species entirely. Isn't science a clean field of study? It is estimated to have been between 3 to 7 metres long and 0.6 to 2 metres high, weighing between 0.9 to 3.6 tonnes. Some of the bones in the skull weren't fully ossified, however, so the animal was likely a subadult when it died, meaning it could have gotten larger, with high estimates putting it at above 9 metres. Like other Spinosaurs, Irritator had a long, narrow skull with conical teeth. The nostrils were further back along the snout, and the eyes were elevated. These are seen as adaptations for a semi-aquatic lifestyle. In fact, Spinosaurs are often found in areas that have lots of water, like deltas, and their physical adaptations made them better for hunting down aquatic prey. Irritator shared its environment with plenty of fish, turtles and crocodiles, which would have been its prey. Though it's entirely possible it still went for land prey, as it was likely the top predator of its region. It also shared its home with over a dozen species of pterosaur, which could have made a decent meal if it caught one. In fact, one pterosaur fossil was found with a tooth from an irritator lodged in its vertebra. Though this may be scavenging, it does prove that irritator did indeed see these flyers as food. Though there are plenty of pterosaur fossils found in this area, there are very few herbivore dinosaurs, possibly due to a lack of sustainable vegetation. However, there are plenty of piscivores like irritator, whose adaptations may have helped it survive without common land-based prey. Their crocodile-like jaws were supported by a stiff secondary palate and reduced antorbital fenestra. This would have aided them in securing slippery prey like fish, making the skull more resistant to torsion, a trait not seen in more terrestrial carnivorous dinosaurs. Irritator may have had a sail on its back like its relatives, though it's impossible to say for certain and large sails seem to be more prevalent in the larger members of the family, like Spinosaurus itself. In 2020, CT scans were done on the holotype skull to get a better image of what Irritator's brain looked like. They revealed that Irritator could coordinate fast head movements and had a downward inclined snout posture, enabling an unobstructed stereoscopic forward vision, which is important for distance perception and therefore precise snapping motions of its snout. This is good evidence for it having to make quick snapping motions while above or below the water. They also found its hearing was better than a crocodile's, but not as good as an average bird's. So, Irritator. 
the smallest spinosaur, but one that has helped to fill in the gaps of the entire spinosaur family. I'd really love to learn more about this species and South American spinosaurs in general. There are quite a few remains that haven't been properly studied, including the most complete hand of any spinosaur. It'd be good to see if they are also Irritator, or a completely new genus. But what do you think of Irritator? Do you believe it was a specialist pterosaur hunter, or that it stuck more to the water? Let me know what lesser known dinosaur you'd like me to make a video on next. And until then, thank you for watching.